Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 184. Rar! I'm a monster. Games that let you play as the monster. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight, we've got someone looking for games where you get to play the monster, followed by a review of the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay starter set. We wrap up with our usual week in review, where I've got two games to talk about, an old favorite and something totally new to me. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment on our Tea Games episode. Juliet Smith writes, Enjoyed the list. Your description of Aqualin intrigued me. Checked it out on BGG and then Miniature Market. fourteen nice. fifty. Can't beat that. Also, glad to see Jaipur on your list. That's the first one that comes to mind. Very interesting idea to get multiple copies of King Domino and do an 11 by 11 grid. I love the 7 by 7 and this is probably one area in which bigger really is better. Mm. Well, thanks, Juliet. I guess it's somewhat ironic. Uh, just before we started recording the show tonight, we had someone in our chat room complaining that all their kids will play right now is Jaipur. I am glad you enjoyed the episode, Juliet, and I hope you enjoy Aqualin. It really is a really neat two-player game with some really cool components. As for two copies of King Domino, you also have the option, instead of having to buy the same game twice, of picking up Queen Domino. Now, Queen Domino is a standalone game, but it can be combined with King the same way you can combine two copies of the original. Now, this Queen Domino is a meteor game, though. There's resource management, you earn coins, you're going to buy buildings. So to me, I didn't put it on the list because to me, that's not a tea game. It's a step above. But if you really do enjoy King Domino and want a little bit more out of that gameplay, I do recommend picking up Queen Domino. Well, next, a comment on our Founders of Teotihuacan review. Joe Didcrum writes, great review. I played a demonstration game during Gen Con with the designer and enjoyed it very much. I nice. purchased a copy at a very reasonable price of $35 and can't wait to get it to the table with our game group. That, to me, is a sign of a good game. In addition, I found the product quality to be perfectly fine for what the game is and actually refreshing that it wasn't overproduced like a lot of games seem to be nowadays. Well, thanks, Joe. Um, my only problem with the production is that I thought the copy we had was more of a prototype than it was. Like, I knew it was a pre-release copy. I was surprised the final copy actually looked the same as what I had, uh, except for a couple minor differences, like some of my cubes were miscolored. But I expected something to be improved in some way, and it wasn't. And I don't mean this is a bad thing. It's just my expectations were wrong. I just I was looking forward to see what the final copy looked like. And I'm like, oh, it looks like what I have. So I got to say, I do definitely appreciate them keeping it simple so that they can offer the game at such a low price point, which is quite the contrast to some of their other tea games with lots of production quality. Well, next we have a comment that could potentially full, turn into a full episode at some point. Okay. Mark Picklesimer wrote in to say, Hello, I just recently watched several of your Aventuria videos and have been wondering now that I have the base game and about 10 expansions. <laughs> What's the best way to go about diving into this game? Is it best to open everything, add all the sets together? How do you have your materials organized? I would love to see a video of this on your channel sometime. Well, hey, Mark. Uh, awesome to hear from someone else diving into Aventuria. Aventuria is fantastic. Uh, I am really pleased to hear people were actually able to get the game here in North America at Gen Con. It uh, makes me happy that both people are finding our content useful and being able to actually finally get the game. Though I got to say, I, after seeing this, I did go shopping online and I still haven't seen it in any of the online game stores. So hopefully this isn't just a Gen Con exclusive. Now to answer Mark's questions. So do not open everything. No, I the, in, in that way leads madness. I think that's how the quote goes. So do not, uh, no. Start with a box that's a, you know, standard board game size box. It says the dark eye at the top, adventure adventure card game, and the two designers underneath. That's all that's on it. 
this is the core box. There's nothing that says core box because, well, when it came out, it was the only thing out. So I don't think they knew they were going to have to put the word core. You're going to grab this. It's going to give you your basic four characters, rules for campaign play and duels. Campaign's way better. And three adventures, two short and one long one. That's where you want to start. Now, that said, if you have it, which hopefully you got this at Gen Con, I don't know if it was available, or if you can find the Master Taylor's Poltergeist demo kit, start with that. This is an awesome small set of cards intro deck that gives you a 15-minute intro to the game that is fantastic for onboarding. Plus, it's just a really fun little adventure where you're fighting clothing. Now, for more info on the demo kit and Adventuria, check out our reviews. It's a fantastic game that I hope I can start talking about again without teasing people because no one would be able to find it. Now, as for organization, what I am currently using, shout out to our friends at Quiver Time here, are Quiver Time deck boxes. And I have like one deck box for characters. I have another deck box for henchmen. I have another deck box for the adventures. And I have that all in this big wooden case that my wife found me for Christmas. And then I use a binder for the actual, um, like the scenario cards, because there's only two or three for each one. It works really good, but that's something I could probably show off better on a video. So speaking about getting a video started, I am totally up for it. Actually, I could see that being very useful. Our Aventuria content actually does really well, despite the fact no one can get the dang game. So I am totally up for it for multiple reasons. One, just to advocate for the game. Two, because I think it'll perform well, which we're always kind of concerned about. Plus, I think it'd be actually useful. But I don't want to do that until I can confirm people can actually get the game and not just get it at Gen Con. I, I feel bad every time I talk about this game and then someone gets a hold of me, he's like, where can I get it? And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. So until the game is out in retail in North America, you're probably not going to get that video. But if you do have any more questions or you know what, send me a private message. I can probably take a picture of what I've got right now and how things are organized. All right, well, I think that's where we'll stop for this week's comments. Mm -hmm. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A couple of important announcements before we move on. All right, for those of you here live in the lobby right now, Wednesday night on Twitch, it is your last day to enter our fourth anniversary favorites giveaway where you can win a copy of Unfair, Space Base, Arnak, or Garintho. We're going to be drawing a winner after the end of the show tonight, and we'll be announcing that winner on our August 24th live show next week. Next up, we have some bittersweet news. Now, the good part is that I've started the, move, the work to move down to Windsor. Yes, that explains the more room on Sean's shelf as he starts packing behind it. Now, sadly, though, this means no more Sean from Hamilton, not Sean Hamilton jokes anymore, which I'm going to sorely miss. Uh, it also means I'm going to be really busy for the next little while. And that means there's a good chance we're going to have to interrupt our reg regular schedule. Yeah, which obviously can't be avoided. Now, added to that, I am having some dental work done on the 7th of September. So we may also miss that week, though I don't know at this point which way it'll go because I go for a consult and then they're going to determine if they're going to pull the tooth. I don't think I want to record the same night I had a tooth extraction, having had them done before. But overall, really, Sean, take whatever time you need, right? Like this move has been a long time coming and it's a very positive thing overall. Your health and safety is way more important than getting the show out on time. And I'm sure everyone will just wait till we get back. Now, at this point, we don't even know how much of a disruption this is going to be. Yeah. So consider this a general heads up that we may have to cancel some shows in the coming month or so. Now, what I'll try to do is keep everyone informed through our Discord and social media. And we'll try to give as much heads up as we can. If there's any chance we're going to cancel recording, I'll try to let you know ahead of time. Though I do apologize if it does happen to be last minute. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from Twitter, where Servant of the Sacred Fire asked, For his seventh birthday, my youngest wants a board game in which he can play as the monster. Any suggestions? Well, thanks for the great question and happy birthday, Sacred Fire Jr. Um, when I first saw this, I was thinking there's got to be a bunch of these, right? Like games you play the monster. There's tons of those out there, aren't there? And a handful of games did come to mind right away. I'll get to those in a minute. But after those like first five or so that I'm like, yeah, I've got this, this, this and this. I was like, wait, that maybe that's it. And then I started thinking about more and I'm like, actually, this is a pretty uncommon theme. This is not 
a a this isn't terraforming Mars or farming. This is this is a a theme that I think is actually kind of underexplored. And it also depends on how you want to define monster. Though I yeah. think knowing the question is coming from the point of a seven year old does help to clarify that. Yeah. <laughs> And I got to say, after after doing some digging and research and thanks to some awesome folk on Twitter, I was able to find some more games, um, especially when I decided to include RPGs as well as board games, which I didn't think of at all when I first read the question, um, though I still ran into a problem finding games for a seven year old, because while there are a number of games that fit monsters, how many are going to appeal to a younger kid? Now, have we, as we've said in the past, age alone isn't really much of a deciding factor for games. True. Some kids are playing Power Grid and some are playing Memory, as well mm -hmm. as all the games in between. And that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Whatever level they're playing at, playing games and having fun is what matters. Exactly. So what I did here is I am taking into account the seven-year-old thing, right? That's part of it. But again, not knowing how skilled, unskilled, those are wrong words. What types of games the seven-year-old's capable of playing? Um, I decided we'd expand the top instead of talking about games where you play the monster that would appeal to seven year olds. I'm just going to go with every game. Well, not every game out there, but every game we could find that sounded good that anyone can play for any age where you play the monster and not just kids games where you play the monster. Though I am going to start the list off with the stuff that I think is going to be better for younger kids. So here we go with our list of games where you or at least someone in the game is playing the monster. Now, I'm going to do one side note before you get to that, since someone's already brought it up in the chat. Um, while there are a number of monsters throughout history and there are other ways you can interpret monster, we are mainly taking this to be the rar monster. You know, tooth and claws, hairy, hideous. No, no, there is very good argument that in Monopoly, you play the monster. And that's not this list we're yeah, talking for, about. For our, for our purposes, Hitler is not a monster yes. in this scenario. So you could play Secret Hitler if you want a game where you want to play that particular monster. Not my usual game recommendation. Again, we're looking at Mar Monster, which is why I went with that title of the episode being Rar on the yep. monster to try to get that across. So, of course, the first one I've already had someone in the chat call it out. It's the first game that popped into my head as soon as I read this question is, of course, King of Tokyo. This is a great game for a seven year old, in my opinion. Kids love this game. Adults love this game. You play a kaiju playing a game of King of the Hill. That's King of Tokyo, King of the Hill. You want to be the monster on top. The monster in Tokyo is versus everyone else. And then everyone else is trying to beat the monster in Tokyo. You're in points for staying in Tokyo. You can knock other players out. And the whole thing's based on a very Yahtzee like dice system with some rules for improving your monster through um, buying cards. This is the biggest thing that's going to limit your age group. As long as a kid can read, you're good with King of Tokyo. I would hope by seven, but you never know. And that was King of Tokyo. Now, my follow up to this is King of New York. This one is for a bit older kids and is probably going to appeal to strategy gamers, hobby board gamers more. This is basically the same game. You're still in Tokyo. You're still battling each or sorry, you're not still in Tokyo. You're still battling over a city. In this case, it's New York instead of Tokyo. But the difference is, is you got like military units attacking you and you can destroy them for victory points. And there's just more options available. And it's not just we beat up each other. King of New York to me is a step up from King of Tokyo, though I'll admit most of the time when I want to play that kind of game, I just stick to the original because I want the light, fluffy party game feel. And that was King of New York. Next, I have Monster Factory. So this is going to be the first of many games where I'm kind of stretching the limits of playing the monster. You're not playing a monster in this game, but you are building one or more. Uh, this is a tile laying game where you're going to connect these purple and green tiles together to try to make the monster with the most eyes. And if you manage to complete one monster, you then get to start building minions. It's a it's a really simple, really quick. Um, this is my intro tile laying game to for for kids or younger kids or to someone who's like never even played Carcassonne. It's a great way to just get that. You need to match all the four edges of your tile to place it. There's some really fun mechanics in this and a little bit of take that where you can just instead of placing your piece, give it to your opponent to force them to play it. And that was Monster Factory. Now, the next one I thought of once Monsters Menace America. Now, to me, this is a classic Avalon Hill game at this point. It's been out for a long time. 
I might be out of print, and I do apologize if it is. I did not double check this list to make sure all these games are in print. Uh, this is like a more complex tactical version of King of Tokyo. In this game, you're playing a kaiju. You control one monster, but you also control one faction of the military. And you're trying to move around the hex board and destroy as many cities as you can while hindering your opponents with those military units. And then at the end of the game, once a certain time limit is lane reached, it really does turn into Tokyo because it becomes a big brawl. It's everyone who's still standing battles each other till it's the last monster standing. Now, I will say seven could be a bit too young for this one or just right. It would depend on the kid. And that was Monsters Menace America. Story and Cat, you still have my copy. <laughs> Next, I have Rampage, now renamed as Terror in Meeple City. Hey, board game publishers, don't name your game after a classic game if, unless you have the actual rights. Uh, this is a fun dexterity game where you'll be pushing, tossing, flicking, and yes, <sighs> blowing things around the map. Nowadays, you may want to get one of those little blower squeegee things instead of blowing on your game components. Um, you are doing this on a board that is filled with cardboard skyscrapers that are held up by meeples. So when your things hit the buildings, the meeple fall and then the ceilings fall and it makes a big mess. You're getting points for eating meeples and hitting other monsters. It really is a board game version of the classic video game Rampage with the classic, you know, Kong, Lizzie. They, they don't have those names, but... There's a reason it was originally called Rampage and a reason it no longer is as well. And that is now known as Terror in Meeple City. All right, the next one I have, this came up based on a suggestion on Twitter, and I agree with it, is Unmatched, depending on the set. So Unmatched is the Restoration Games modern version of the classic Jedi epic duels which no one realizes in any case it was a Star Wars game originally. But what it is, is it's a card-driven combat game where you are fighting ridiculous things against each other that probably shouldn't fight each other. So you've got like Bruce Lee versus the monster, the T-Rex. There are a number of villains and monsters out for this one, including uh, Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Medusa is a playable character in this and more. And they are constantly releasing new sets for Unmatched. This is an extremely popular two-player dueling game that can also play up to four. I don't know anyone that doesn't like this game at this point. And that was Unmatched. All right. I'm going with the fact that a giant T-Rex is pretty much a monster. So there is a two-player game out there called Raptor, uh, where one player is playing a pack of raptors. Think Jurassic Park with the nasty nail with the big claw on it. And the other player is playing a hapless human trying to survive against the raptors. It's a super asymmetric game running around on a map, supposedly extremely engaging, where one player gets to play a pack of dinos, which to me is playing the monsters. And that was Raptor. Okay, yeah, this one I think counts fully. Disney Villainous. Depending on how monstrous you consider some of the Disney villains, some are definitely more rare monster than others. I think you've got some real monsters mixed in with those villains. I, it's kind of a hard call on that one. Now, this is an extremely asymmetric game where every player is playing with a completely different player board with completely different player options, aiming for a completely different goal. And on your turn, you're going to try to um, advance your goal while trying to disrupt other players' goals by playing hero cards on the various villains and disrupting their plans. This is one I probably never would have played and got totally sucked in by once I finally sat down and tried. This was back in the days where you didn't really trust licensed games, and this was one of the first ones to start changing people's minds, and it's still fantastic. One of the great things about Villainous is there's the starter set with six villains, but there's all kinds of three villain sets out there. Those are all actually standalone games. You don't need to own the core game. You can just pick up one of those and start playing, or you can mix and match. And that was Disney Villainous. All right, getting back to actual monsters, not stretching anything here. Godzilla Tokyo Clash. This great looking game from Funkoverse that not only features the big guy himself, but many other of the classic Toho monsters. Now, in this one, it's another asymmetric game where each of the monsters gets its own unique deck that they use to battle each other and cause devastation to the city on a modular rearranged deck with 3D buildings on it. 
Uh, this is up there for table presence games that just look cool. And I know people who bought this just for the like Godzilla and Rodan figures. And that was Godzilla Tokyo Clash. Now, speaking of Funko games, there is the Funkoverse games, very similar to um, Unmatched in that way. There are a number of different sets, and this is actually a fairly solid, detailed skirmish battle game that happens to use pocket-sized Funko Pops. And I got to admit, I wouldn't, nothing that interested me i don't care about pops i i'm not a funko collector but i sat down and played this game and i was like this is up there with like skirmish warhammer play like this is really well done each character has their own unique abilities they have cooldown powers and well honestly to say be honest the, the figures look kind of cool when they're on the board together now specifically they just released the universal monster set so you've got you know your classics there in black and white, there's also a Nightmare Before Christmas set. There's a Jaws set, a Jurassic Park set, and I'm sure more monsters to come. And that was Funkoverse. All right, this one I found getting ready for tonight's episode, grabbing the games for a backdrop. I spotted Sorcerer on my shelf. Now, this one is definitely not for seven-year-olds. Um, read our review to find out exactly why. Uh, this is a mix of Smash Up and dueling card game like very magic the gathering feeling dueling card game set in victorian england a bit of steampunk going on there too now you build your deck by picking a realm a domain and a character and then you mash those three decks together and you go at it with the other player vying for control of three different areas you need to take over two out of three areas of england now as for playing the monster just look at the cards in this game, look at the name of the cards, look at the theme of the cards, and you will fully realize you aren't playing some happy-go-lucky planeswalker in Sorcerer. And that was Sorcerer. Next, I have Monster Slaughter. This takes your typical teens versus the horrible masked or unmasked monster and turns it around where you're the monsters hunting the teenagers. Now, the community claims this is an age 10 plus or so, so I would guess it would depend on you and your seven year old enjoy watching Nightmare Before Christmas or Nightmare, Nightmare Before Christmas, sorry, <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street together or not. Or if you're into the Freddy movies, if that's or sorry, the Jason movies, I, I know some seven year olds that love stuff like that. Um, that would determine to me if it'd be good for that age. Great. But I do love the twist on this theme. That was Monster Slaughter. All right. Monster Monsters. Similar to Monster Slaughter, because again, it's based on your typical monster hunter tropes where, you know, the Van Helsings are coming after you and everything. But instead, you're the monsters trying to hunt the humans. Now, this is a two player only card game. This is listed for five players and seems uh, sorry for age five up five plus and seems pretty light, like age five plus. It's got to be pretty late. Sadly, though, there wasn't a lot of information out there to tell me more on this one. Now, it was nominated for a Best Family Game Award, so I think this might be a perfect fit, actually, despite the fact that I wasn't able to find a lot of information about the game. And that was Monster Monsters. Village Attacks. Again, this seems to be a trope of playing the monsters. You are playing an infamous monster of folklore. Think like, you know, your Frankensteins or your, your uh, Hunchback who has to defend their castle from the wave of angry pitchfork-wielding villagers. This is basically a tower defense game with some really cool-looking minis with a unique theme, and I dig the whole concept of that. It's, it's you are the monster trying to defend against the angry mob. And that was Village Attacks. Next, I have Boss Monster. This one is the dungeon crawling version of that theme, though it's actually older. You are playing the boss, the boss monster, the final fight in a dungeon crawler. Though I got to say the look looks more kind of Castlevania to me than it does fantasy. It's kind of that look. You are the boss at the center of the dungeon, building various dungeon rooms to try to defend yourself from waves of heroes. Personally, I think this one's really simple, quick to learn, but there's a lot more going on than you'd expect, like trying to build your dungeon at the start so the heroes don't come to you. Switching over to my dungeon now kicks butt, so I want the heroes to come to me is a great part of this game. I really enjoy that. And I got to say, the theme of this and the pretty simple gameplay, I think, could be perfect for a seven-year-old. 
And that was Boss Monster. Next, I have Dungeon Lords. Not perfect for a seven-year-old. This is Boss Monster taken to extremes. This one is a heavy Euro game that I doubt would be right for our question asker tonight. But I want to mention it because I love it. This has the exact same theme of Boss Monster. You are defending your lair from the heroes, but is much more involved. You're digging corridors, you're hiring minions, you're having to feed your minions, you're building trap rooms. This is Dungeon Keeper the board game without the ability to slap your imps. And that was Dungeon Lords. Next, I have Die in the Dungeon. This is another reverse dungeon crawler that I wanted to call out, and that's because it's solo. You are playing a powerful fantasy monster. Um, think Beholders is one of the, the the main, like on the cover of the box, you got a Beholder, or you're, you know, you're an owl bear, and you're stolen from your home, and you're tossed into a random dungeon by some annoying wizard. In this one, you have to actually wander around this random dungeon and defeat every hero to win. And that was Die in the Dungeon. Next, we have some one verse mini games where one player. Oh, this is where. This is oh. where your notes didn't keep up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Next, I have one that is coming soon. Haven't gotten to try this one, obviously, but it is Gathering Gloom. This is a one to four player game where you play a family of monsters trying to solve crises in the town in your mansion while trying to avoid being outed by the villagers. Obviously inspired by classic TV series like the Monsters in the Adams Family, this one sounds quite fun. And that was Gathering Gloom. And just before we went live, much to Sean's chagrin, because I threw this in there and it's not in his notes, uh, my daughter came to me with one more to add to the list, and that is Vampires of the Night. This is a great kids game that my kids loved when they were younger, where you are a vampire trying to get all the garlic off the board. And you literally physically, it's a dexterity game where you have a board with a bunch of holes in it, and you're trying to knock little garlic tokens down into the holes. The interesting bit here is that it's a dexterity game where you actually use a poker to move your vampire around the board, which is harder to do than you would think. And that was Vampires of the Night. Well, next we have some one verse mini games, games where one player is the monster, but the others aren't. We weren't initially sure if we should include these as only one player plays the monster, but figured, why not? I guess technically I probably should have put Raptor up here, but because it was two player, it didn't click in. All right, the number one, this one popped in my head when I was thinking about games when you play the monster. My personal copy is right behind me over there, and that is Fury of Dracula. I think I might own this game at age seven. I'm not sure. It's I, The one I have is an original Games Workshop version of it. I think it's now in its fourth edition. And everyone I know who plays this game actually says the newer editions are better. So don't be jealous of my copy back there. Um, this is a game where one player is Dracula and everyone else are the vampire hunters trying to catch them. It uses some really smart hidden movement systems. Um, and I... DM screens, one versus many, extremely popular. It's been around this time. And if you want the feel of like playing Dracula, sneaking around, trying to ambush people, it's a fantastic game. And that was Fury of Dracula. Next, I have Not Alone, one I will admit I haven't gotten to try myself, but I have heard really good things. And this actually is the most recommended monster game on Twitter based on my questions. This is a game based on, honestly, Alien. I'll just say it's Alien. But any of those, you're on a spaceship, you're on a Space Hulk, you're alone on a planet, and one player plays the creature. Now, I will say this one might be a bit much for a seven-year-old, but the community does say 10 plus. The box is like 14 plus. So it is possible. Uh, this is supposed to be a really well done one versus many game that doesn't use the whole hidden map thing that a lot of these other games have where you have to track where you've moved and where you're going to. And that was Not Alone. All right. I think I'm actually going to skip this one Okay, that's on there because we already basically talked about how we're not going to. We're not going to highlight those type of monsters. All right, jumping down one, skipped over one, and decided it didn't fit well, is Jaws. Jaws is a monster, right? Like, one player plays the shark, which many people consider to be one of the famous movie monsters. I know people are still fighting to make Jaws an official Universal monster, because it's from Universal Pictures. And if you go to Universal Orlando, you can get your picture taken next to the shark. This is a great one-versus-many game, a game that completely surprised me. Even as 
someone who had never seen the movies because I didn't like horrors growing up. It, the game played great. One person's playing the shark. The other person's out there at first trying to get um, barrels on the shark. And then you switch to a second half of the game where your shark's trying to destroy your boat while you're trying to kill the shark. Really well done game. Uh, one of the games that made me realize just how brilliant the design group Prospero Hall is. Absolutely. And that was Jaws. Well, so far, all we've talked about are board games, but there mm -hmm. are many RPGs out there that let you play the monster. What I don't actually know of any really kid-friendly RPGs that fit this genre, the ones we're about to mention are for a more adult audience. Yeah, like the I like Mermaid Adventures. I get you're playing a mermaid. Does that count? Like I honest and hero kids, I didn't really see any monstrous races. If they're out there, please let us know if you know of a RPG targeted at kids where you play monsters. Like, I know there's that calendar with the baby monsters. Like, has anyone written the RPG version? We get to play those baby monsters. That might work. So the first game I thought of when I heard play the monster was Monster Hearts. Now, I'm sure no seven-year-old wants to play a game about teen angst and sexual frustration. It's definitely a game where you get to play the monster and a very popular one. For RPG recommendations, this is the one I saw the most. This is, I will admit, not a game I have tried, but I have sat in on a session. It's uh, powered by the apocalypse. Uh, it's, it's uh, what do you call it? What's the one you run? I can't remember the name it's of it. Ma it's Masks. It's, it's Masks with Monsters. Yes, yeah. you, are, you are playing Teen Wolf or, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer or any of those teen angsty, everyone's dating everyone and in love with everyone unless they hate each other that week monster of the week stuff going on and that was monster hearts all right next one i have is wicked ones this is a forged in the dark role-playing game where you play fantasy monsters raiding human lands now a number of people recommended this one to me while researching the topic and i gotta say it sounds really fun this is a you're playing the orc hordes and the gnolls and the bad guys attacking the human lands and trying to avoid or defeat the heroes. I got to say, seeing this, I knew of a number of board games that had this theme. I didn't realize there were it was an RPG out there that let you do this. And that was the Wicked Ones. All right, we grew up uh, through the 80s and into the 90s, and I think anyone else that was alive at the time period is well aware of probably the most popular role-playing games about playing monsters, and those are the various World of Darkness games. Of course, the most well-known being Vampire the Masquerade, but also including other games where you could play werewolves or mummies or fairies, or I don't even remember some of the other ones I have downstairs. Ghosts, I think, was one. And well, there was a Street Fighter version, which was pretty monstrous on its own. And that was the World of Darkness games. Next, something that to me is kind of the same thing, and that's Urban Shadows. To me, this is someone who was a, a World of Darkness fan trying to modernize that game. This is a modern urban fantasy role-playing game that uses a more modern rule set, more narrative style of play. It's more of a, you know, a, a, a story game than the old White Wolf system. And and to me, this is a, wow, we hate the D10 dice pool system and we kind of hate where World of Darkness went. We want to do our own thing with it. This is where you are playing in modern world, but fairies are real or vampires are real and monsters are real. And that was Urban Shadows. Next, I have Undying. This is a diceless role-playing game from Magpie Games that is all about vampirism, but a totally different style than Urban Shadows and World of Darkness. I haven't played this one myself, but if you want a different look at playing vampires, everyone playing a vampire, check out Undying. And that was Undying. All right, finally, for role-playing games, I do need to call out an old AD&D second edition book, The Book of Humanoids. This had rules for playing non-human humanoid races, most of which were considered monsters at the time the book was out. Now, I ran a campaign where everyone picked a race from this book, and we had a great time. Now, I have no idea if anyone's done a D&D 5e version of this book, but at the time, it was pretty groundbreaking and a lot of fun to play around with. That is the Book of Humanoid. So finally, we have some honorable mentions. While we already stretched the definition of playing the monster quite a bit, these ones go even further. 
Yeah, these are ones I'm not even sure if we should have mentioned or not. Uh, the first is Monster Apocalypse. So this one's just weird because the game's been forever, like, stretched out. This game came out and was canceled and then came out again and then was canceled. Then someone else bought it and put it out and it was canceled. Now, originally, when Monster Apocalypse came out, it was a collectible click style game where you bought booster packs and random packs that I think would have been perfect for a seven year old because it used a pretty simple grid and everything was pre-painted. There wasn't any hobby elements to it. Now in 2022, this has become a full hobby miniature kaiju battle skirmish game now published by Privateer Press, the people behind the Warma Horde system. Here you're playing a team of kaiju and other units. So you're not the monster. You're like the invading alien force or the human defenders or basically the Ultra 7 or the Ultraverse. Or not Ultraverse, Ultraman. Uh, this is a really neat game, but you're playing a bunch of monsters instead of the monster. And like I said, the latest version of this game is a full-on hobby. Assemble your miniatures, build scenery. Uh, more of a lifestyle game than the original collectible one. And that was Monster Apocalypse. Next, I have Smash Up that I only include because I included like Unmatched in that. So this is a game about taking two decks and smashing them together, then playing cards in an area majority battle where you're fighting off, off over different areas of the city. Um, there are a lot of decks here, and many of the decks to me I would consider monsters. There might even be a deck called Monsters, but there's dinosaurs and there's aliens and there's kaiju and there's... Um, I'm flying unicorns, which I think some people consider pretty monstrous. And that was Smash Up. Uh, next, one of my favorite games of all time set. One of my favorite settings of all time is Chaos in the Old World. Now, I wanted to put this on the list, but enough other people pointed out games I didn't think fit on the list that kind of fit this theme. Now, I don't know. This doesn't really give you the feel of playing a monster, but you are specifically playing one of the five chaos gods in the Warhammer world. So that's kind of your high level goal. And each play is completely different, but really you're just moving units on a map and it's area majority and backstabbing. So I don't know if that gives you the feel of playing a monster, though thematically you are one of the five chaos gods, which are quite monstrous. And that was chaos in the old world. Now, the arguments people put against me when I recommended Chaos in the Old World were games like War of the Ring or Warhammer Fantasy Battle or Age of Sigmar or Warhammer 40K or any of these two player war games where one side is an army of monsters. Now, I'm not sure this would count, but I fear if I had to put on Chaos in the Old World, I figured I would throw on these kind of in a big bulk thing. Like, yes, I get it. Your Tyranids and Warhammer 40k are monsters. Fair enough. But again, I don't get the feel you're playing the monster with those. Right. And so that is general two player war games. <laughs> yes, they war include games. monstrous factions, I right. guess. Yeah, I don't know how I'm putting this one on the, the, the linked version. Uh, next, I have Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. I think this one fits better, actually. Uh, than the last two. This time you are playing the monsters raiding the human lands, just like one of the role playing games we mentioned above. Uh, this is a flip on the theme of Valeria Card Kingdoms, which is a game I love. Valeria Card Kingdoms is fantastic. Shadow Kingdoms is also good. Again, though, you're not playing a monster, you're playing a monstrous horde. But something about this one, because you're actually customizing your horde and leveling up and improving, gave me more of a feel that I was playing a monster like a general of that army than playing the army itself. So I think this one's this one's more borderline than, say, Chaos of the Old World. And that was Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Next, I have Warband Against the Darkness. I think I mainly wanted to put this on the list because no one's heard of this game, and I think it's a hidden gem. This is a game about forming that monstrous horde, right? So you got your horde of orcs or your horde of armies about to attack the um the heroes that sounds like it's cooperative because you're all playing various generals and lieutenants who are vying for power trying to get your minions to be at the top of the ranks and to lead the various armies as they're about to go into battle and it's really just like a big top down um what do you call that in a company and you have your 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 levels can't think of the dang term org chart yes basically you're building an org chart for your fantasy army, trying to make sure your me your meeple are in the right place, right? That you're, you've got the most people on the map. It is a very unique game. It's a very unique theme. It's one of the most unique games in my my collection. And you are pay playing one faction. Like you might be the gi fire giants and Sean might be the rock golems. And we're trying to get our units to take part in the big fight. Unique theme. 
again, though, you're not really playing the monster. You're playing a horde. That was Warband Against the Darkness. All right, my last honorable mention is Tyrants of the Underdark. This is another one where you're actually playing the leader of a monstrous faction, in this case, Drow Houses. Drow are one of the most well-known humanoid monsters in Dungeons & Dragons, so I think this fits at least tangentially. Even if it doesn't, I don't mind calling out such a great game. This is a mashup of deck building and folk on the map with plenty of backstabbing and intrigue. It's another one that we've reviewed. Check out our review to learn more about this fantastic game. That is, uh, yeah, sorry. Tyrants that was Tyrants of the Underdark. Of the Underdark. Uh, so I'm going to slip in one little uh, minor yep. honorable mention here. And this is arguable whether you are playing uh, playing monsters or playing with monsters. But this is a recent Vladimir Shuchi game from 2019, Monster Baby Rescue. Okay. Where, and this is very much family. And this is very, this is probably a fantastic game for a seven-year-old. It just may not be quite monstrous enough because you're playing with monsters rather than as monsters. Uh, but that's right. Monster Baby Re- Rescue by Vladimir Suchi, who's uh, done such fantastic games we love as uh, um, Brain Fart. Um, Pulsar. <laughs> okay, I didn't know which game you were going to call yeah. out by Suchi. All right, if you're going to throw that in, I'll also throw Dungeon Pets which was a lighter version of Dungeon Lords, all about raising the monsters for your dungeon. But again, you're playing the person raising the monsters, so I didn't throw that on here. So I think similar theme as that one. I will admit I have not played Dungeon Pets because I love Dungeon Lords, and people told me it's a lighter version. I'm like, I don't want a lighter version. I want to play Dungeon Lords. I want to play a light version. I'll go grab Boss Monster. Well, that's it for our list of games to let you play the monster. Have you played any of these games? What's your favorite? Let us know in the comments below remember we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions if you got a question for us head to the website click on ask the bellhop fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up anywhere on social media all right now that we've gone through our list of monstrous games i know the chat room has had some more to add here some of these are fantastic uh so uh major kayla says if you want non-humanoid rpgs for kids there is weird scouts and good strong hands that's weird scouts w-y-r-d scouts and good strong hands oh which were both any nominees for best family game good strong hands looked amazing that is based on um the never-ending story the, the rock biter who's complaining that he couldn't save his friends from the nothing. Uh, from what I understand, that's a game where you are set in a town where terrible things are happening and you can't escape. And it's up to you to work together to prevent the the trouble that is happening to the town. Weird Scouts, I know nothing about. So that's Weird Scouts, you have some Faye Antress ancestry, be it pixie, giant, etc. Okay. Apparently. Uh, and Ryan's mentioning that uh, Dragonflight allows you to play dragons in 5e. Uh, and uh, there is an upcoming. Yeah, I remember 3.5 had an entire book there, on playing. There's an up. There's an upcoming uh, game called Delver's Guide to the Beast World that's uh, forthcoming. So uh, that's I have to see what that is when it comes out. There is a 3.5 supplement that I can picture the cover of. My cousin brought it over uh, when we were playing 3.5, or Deanna's cousin actually, and and it lets you play dragons. Age of Worms. That might be it. That might be the one. Oh, that was three two e though. I swear I'm picturing a three point five book. And uh, Ron Talks Tabletop mentioned uh, says we mentioned Boss Monster, but what about Overboss? I don't know enough about Overboss to have put it on the list. No one else recommended it, and I didn't think to go look it up. I I don't know if it's isn't it just I don't know. I don't know Overboss myself. Overboss, a boss monster adventure. Conquer the world and become the Overboss in this puzzly map building game. Uh, again yeah are you playing the monster in that one maybe i guess if you are in boss monster because i will say in boss monster the one thing that is missing from that is i don't think you get to figure out what monster you are like i don't think it's like you are dracula you are the blob you are the gelatinous cube oh here's one i didn't think of uh ex libris in a way but really that's technically your minion the the library building game, right? Because the one person had a, had a golem, another person had a gelatinous mm. cube. So you don't really get the feel you're playing a monster. No, it's just really you don't. have a playing piece with a special power. 
Uh, so one I didn't put on the list is a dragon game. Don't know that one. E P Y L L I O N. Yeah, no, I da- I'm with D. Yeah, Ex Libra doesn't count. Apillion was uh was the latest recommendation we got on Twitter, but it was just before we got live, so I didn't get to oh, do okay. the the recommendation. So someone else recommended that. Um, I see not so family friendly as Hidden Worlds, soon to be released to play as others. Um, there that is another cool mini or not. The others was another one that people recommended. That's another you collect your army and you battle against someone else. Plus, uh, the game wasn't very well regarded, and it's very much not for seven-year-olds. It's right. the, the <laughs> seven armies of the seven deadly sins, mm. and it's very over-the-top miniatures ranging from body to disgusting. Right. Uh, one of the ones I wanted to put on this list and I couldn't decide was, what do you think for Pandora? Like, I know the government views you as monsters. Are no, you monsters? No, 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 uh, no, you're, I mean, you're, you're trying to, uh, control yourself. You're, you, no, no, that's that, okay. that, 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 that goes into the not evil, uh, evil doesn't equal, uh, evil. Yeah. Evil doesn't equal monster. I think that would be, I think that would be almost problematic calling that one. Uh, well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I'm like, I, I had the thought. I'm like, I don't think so. No. Uh, I mean, there are so- probably supers games where you do play a monster per se uh, or more of a monstrous yeah someone pointed out any game you play you can play the hulk was one of the things someone said on twitter and i'm like all right i can see that yeah and even the beast like character mutation to me uh, you know again just the fact that you're monstrous doesn't necessarily make you a monster it's it's that combination of uh of things although i guess we didn't really we didn't uh yeah, we didn't spend a lot of time defending it, but again, I'm thinking seven year old thoughts of monster. Yeah, like technically in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, you can go down the corruption path, and DCC, you can be a sorcerer and go down that version of corruption, which could lead to monstrous things. But I don't think that's the thing. There's got to be a game out there you play Frankenstein. I swear, my friend Mike had one. And it was dice based and you put dice in your various like joints to do things, but I could not find it. And then there was another kaiju game where you built a city out of square cards and you moved your standees around. And when you fought someone else, you played a card from your hand and it was like bite slash claw. And then there was some other thing that was super powerful and you played rock, paper, scissors, and that's who determined who won the fight. And if I remember you were flipping or collecting the cards and it was really good, but I can't remember what. It was called at all. I tried writing the person who taught the demo of it, but they weren't available, so I didn't get an answer on that one. So there's abomination in the air of Frankenstein, but you're playing. No, you're, you're building playing Frankenstein. Well, Frankenstein, yes, again, again, you get there. the the argument that the real monster was Frankenstein, but yes, yeah, abomination. That's that's again a seven year old. I don't know, depending on <laughs> what you're not. into, because you're, you're kind of literally body like, horror. yes, there's body horror in that one. Like, I just, I'm like, there has to be more. I, I Like, Gargoyles? That doesn't count, right? The Gargoyles board game? Like, Gargoyles uh, are monsters. I mean, for a seven-year-old, but... I think Gargoyles probably are monsters. No, but I'm talking about Disney's Gargoyles. Yeah, no, I know. Like, there is a Disney's Gargoyles game, so that might go on our list. Yep. An official Monsters game. Ooh, that, that would yep. be interesting. There is one. Mm-hmm. Either out or it's coming. Are you oh, seeing yeah, Chad on that? Monsters, aren't they? Yes. I swear there's a Monsters, a modern Monsters. Well, there was a 1964 no, card game. <laughs> yeah, there was a 65 version and Monsters Picnic and there were multiple games, but I thought there was a new one announced. Uh, I see four right now, a 64, 65, 65, and 65 yeah, back for Monsters, was... the TV show. Draconomicon there, Ron Talks Tabletop, got the 3.5 book. I couldn't remember. Uh, okay. That was an I'm like, I thought it was something, but it was, I'm like, I thought I didn't want to mix it up with those like Pyronomicon or whatever those books that are just like lots of weird tchotchkes shoved in a book <laughs> that are extremely popular. Yeah, so I guess there isn't a new, uh, no, I guess there yes. isn't a new Monsters game. Monster. So one of the RPGs we mentioned sounded like it's for playing the Monsters. Uh, or no, Adam's, that was the Adam's board game. Sorry. could be argued to be a, uh, yes. playing Monsters. Uh, there's the the Find Uncle Fester card game. Well, again, that's what Gathering Gloom is, right? That's that's yeah. the the theme of Gathering Gloom is you're playing a family of monsters solving crises. 
Thank you, chat room, for all the awesome suggestions and for coming up with stuff just before we said it or just after. I saw all kinds of stuff. Oh, there you go. Curse of the House of Rookwood RPG what? for playing the Adams Family. There we go. I am going to toss that quickly in my notes. <laughs> for when I do the show notes, I'll try to throw in links to these things. Hello, and welcome to a read review of the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition Starter Set. Like many role-playing games, this Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay starter set had quite the theme behind it. Designers include Andrew and Lindy Law, Andrew Leix, T.S. Luker, and Dominic McDowell, with additional production by Paul Bourne, Andrew Law, Dominic McDowell, Sin Quinn, and Jacob Rogers. Fantastic thematic artwork was provided by Paul Bourne, Michael Francina, Ralph Horsley, Andrew Law, Sam Manley, Janine Van Musel, Jonathan O'Donohue, Scott Purdy, and Aaron Rea. This latest introduction to the war to Warhammer is published here in North America by Cubicle 7 under license from Games Workshop. It was originally released in 2018. We actually saw a copy at Origins that year and has an MSRP of €25.99 and seems to be available for under $30 here in the US and Canada. So the prices are kind of all over the place. Now, for those that don't know Warhammer, uh, this is the fantasy version, not the Warhammer 40K. This is a grim, dark fantasy role-playing game set in what they call the old world. And it has a distinctly different flavor from your typical high fantasy role-playing game. Warhammer isn't about playing heroes and saving the day. It's about playing a regular citizen in a world filled with corruption that's constantly threatened by outside influences like the ever-present gods of chaos. This is a game about surviving the day and not saving the world. While there are threats like undead and marauding orcs, the true horrors come from the people themselves, the corruption within and the power behind the throne. As for this starter set, this contains everything you need to bring this grim and perilous world to life and is targeted at new and experienced RPG players as well as longtime fans of Warhammer. Of note to those fans, this box goes back to the traditional mechanics of Warhammer 1st and 2nd edition. Mm -hmm. For a look at what you get in this box, we invite you to check out our Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Starter Set unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Starter Set includes a sturdy board game quality box, which also serves as a DM screen and dice tray. Second time we've seen this. I love it. Uh, the bottom part has a map of the old world, and the top part has some rule references. There's a small read this first booklet, an adventure booklet, which is designed to teach the game as well as give you an adventure to play. A guide to Uber's Reek, which is an extensive source book showcasing one of the Empire's most important cities. There's maps of Uber's Reek in the surrounding area, six character folders, various reference sheets, advantage tokens, and 2d10 dice, as well as three sheets of handouts. Now, I just want to interject here. This isn't something part of our notes, but technically the pronunciation is Uber's Reich, but I'm not going to complain to you because uh, it is canon that the Skaven have been known to pronounce it Uber's Reek. There you go. <laughs> I so, do play Skaven. So you get a you get a buy for being Skaven, but yes, technically uh Uber's Reich should be the pronunciation of that uh Fair of that enough. Name. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, at this point, what I think we should do is go through <laughs> each of these different things you get and talk a bit about each, what they are, and what you thought of each of them. <clears throat> I'm totally losing my Warhammer cred now. Everyone's like, I thought you were a fan. All right, that sounds good. Uh, <laughs> starting with the read this first pamphlet thingy. I, I call this a pamphlet thingy because this and all the character sheets are made in this odd three-fold folder format where you have to open up two sides to see what's inside. I, it's odd. I've never seen this before. But I guess it's I, thematic, maybe. I don't know. feels like you're opening a folder. It, it's an interesting, at least. Um, what I do love is that the sheet exists. I hate when I open a new starter set and there's just all this stuff and I have no clue where to start. And this is also where you get your usual what's a role playing game, what's a GM, how to play this book, who should be playing this and all that stuff. It almost feels like a takeout menu. <laughs> it's yeah, it's yes. kind of the feel you yeah, get from it. But uh, it's not threefold. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. You can see it in the unboxing videos. So next we have the adventure book. 
This is a 47 page soft cover book that features a multi act adventure that teaches you how to play Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th edition. The adventure is a great example of the Warhammer world and the types of stories the designers expect you to tell in this world and does a great job of showcasing how this game is not your typical fantasy RPG. Mm -hmm. In addition to the main adventure, this book also can includes 10 short adventures set in Ubersreich that you can use to keep playing once done. Use with the full Warhammer core rulebook or integrate into the main adventure to stretch it out. Yeah, this book is really the meat of the box and what most people are going to be interested in. Interestingly, there's no rule section here. The designers expect you to just jump in right away with the adventure. Like page one is, here you are, you're an Uber's Reek, read this to the players. Uh, you have Uber's Reich, sorry, I'm probably going to mess it up all night. Um, you happen to be there during the Uber's Reich's big market days and one of the big festivals, and you're going to get to learn the mechanics of making simple, dramatic, and opposed tests while exploring the market. And then, of course, get to test out more rules as things inevitably get more interesting. Now, I suspect this is going to rub many GMs the wrong way. Those who really like to figure things out, dig into the rules, and get them in their head before sitting down with the players. Yes, that is all I will say about that now. Now, while I do love this format for getting the game to the table quickly, and it's a great way to onboard players, it can be terrible as a GM. I am one of those GMs who would rather sit and read through the rules section and then get me to the adventure after. In addition, this is atrocious as a reference book. Getting ready for this review, I found myself flipping back and forth and back and forth trying to find specific rules. In particular, I was looking for fortune and fate rules. There's no index at all on this. There's not even a table of contents. The rules are introduced as needed in the adventure and sidebars. And it ends up the rules I was specifically looking for weren't even in this book. They're on the character sheets. So overall, mixed feeling on the adventure book for that reason. Now, since this is the book that teaches you the mechanics of Warhammer 4th Edition, mm -hmm. before we get to the next bit in this box, how about you give us an overview of the system? Will it seem familiar to longtime Warhammer fans, or is it doing something totally different like 3rd Edition does? So this newest version of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay goes back to the roots of the system using the standard stats, move, weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, initiative, agility, dexterity, intelligence, willpower, fellowship, and wounds. And it's a D100 roll under system. So just like the first and second edition. Now, the big change here from the original is that the game has become skill based for non-combat tasks. Instead of rolling under a stat, you're running rolling under a skill that's based on a stat, which we've seen in many other role playing games. Now, another big one is that melee combat is now an opposed role. You're rolling weapon skill events, the opponents dodge. That's something definitely different. Now, actual tests are simple. You, they're called simple tests. Like That's one type of test. You roll, and if you're under your target, you succeed. If you're over, you fail. That's a simple test. A dramatic test is you make your roll, and you have to determine your success level. You subtract your tens number from the tens number in the target. Then look up the results on a table. And here's where you get the first big modern RPG narrative style element that's in this version. Here's where you get your yes and, yes but, no and, no way, and those results. And interestingly, I thought this was fascinating from a design choice. You need plus two success levels to get a full success without any complications. Which means, especially at low levels, well, you're going to succeed at what you want to do. You're going to cause lots of little problems along the way, which I think is rather thematic for Warhammer. Indeed. Then there's a pose test. Both parties roll and compare their success levels. The one with the highest success level wins. Now, what's really fascinating to me here is that you don't have to pass your test to win an opposed test, which I like. As long as you succeed more or basically your opponent failed worse than you. What's cool about this is specifically for Warhammer in combat, this should reduce the notorious whiff factor, which honestly has been a problem with the game since the first edition. Since as long as you don't fail more than your opponent, you hit in melee. And of course, there's a system for adjusting difficulties for circumstances and all the stuff you'd expect on any here's a target number based role playing system. So it's different, but not unfamiliar, yeah. uh, more polished up to get some of the rust off and to modernize it. Totally agree. 
Now, combat, of course, has more details like foes acting in order of initiative. No, no deep die rolls made, just straight up whoever's initiative is higher. Uh, melee now requires opposed rolls. Ballistic attacks require a dramatic roll. Uh, damage is based on weapon type, success level, and strength bonus. And just like the old system, that's reduced by armor and toughness. Leftover damage causes wounds. And the old hit location system is still there, where you reverse the numbers to hit to figure out where you hit on your opponent. Surely there's a critical hit system as well. This is Warhammer, after all. Of course there is, though it's not introduced until pretty far into the adventure. So I think they're trying to keep things less deadly at the start of the adventure, uh, starting off more like a bar brawl than a, than a deadly encounter. Now, crits here are caused by rolling doubles, which then leads to rolling on another chart. Now, an interesting thing here to me as a long-term fan of Warhammer is this chart is 100% random. You just roll D100. It's not affected by the damage done, the type of damage done, or the success level, or any of that. It's just a D100 straight up roll. I'm not sure if that's just a starter set thing or something from the core rules. I'm hoping the core rules have more detailed critical rules as a long-term fan. That is odd. I, I I don't want my opponent bleeding from the ears after I hit him in the leg. Yeah, like I, I honestly think when running the game, you probably need to fully resolve all the rules before you describe what happened. I think it's probably more how it has to be played. Now, along with this, the players do have various resources to mitigate the randomness of the die rolls. This is something that we see in many modern role-playing games. Now, of course, there's a traditional fate. That's been there since first edition. Spend a fate point, you didn't die. The new, introduce, new system also introduces fortune, which is tied to fate. You get as many fortune points as your fate at the start of each session. These allow you to re-roll one test or add one success level to a roll after you've rolled, which is important to know. Now, there's also two new ones. There's resilience that lets you set the dice to whatever number you want. And Resolve. Resolve is set to your resilience at the start of the game and allows you to remove a condition or ignore a crit. Now, Resolve doesn't replenish each session, but you can get it back by following your character's motivation. Resilience, though, is like fate. Once you spend it, it's gone. So as an old school Warhammer player, I mean, I'm a, I'm a first ed, yep. <laughs> first ed uh, Gronyard, uh, as it were. Uh, that seems like a lot of different, you know, I want to call them cheat mechanics. To overcome the dice. Finally, there's one other new mechanic I really dig, and that is advantage. This is a momentum system that, at least in the starter set, mainly affects combat. I'm hoping in the core rules it's expanded a little more, but I don't know. Every time you attack a surprised opponent or charge into combat or defeat an important NPC or even just win an opposed test in combat or cause damage without an opposed test, which is basically saying you hit and cut, excuse me. Just basically saying you hit in combat, you'd get to take an advantage token. These give you plus 10 to all combat actions going forward. You can continue to build this up until you take a wound or lose an opposed test. And this is another thing that I think is really going to help with that Warhammer whiff factor in games where everyone just stands around and tries to hit each other round after round and you just keep rolling the dice, which was a big problem with first edition. So while I appreciate the designers factoring in the high level of randomness of the system and coming up with solutions and workarounds i do have to wonder that at what point have you put so much duct tape onto a system <laughs> that you really need a new system rather than just keep coming up with patches patches well i see that i think they tried that uh third edition warhammer was a huge diversion from first and second edition while i adored it it's it's honestly one of my favorite systems of all time that led to an awesome three year campaign. In general, Warhammer fans hated it. And I think that was the main drive for this fourth edition to come out and to go back to the roots. Now, one thing I do need to note, while there are a lot of different ways to mitigate things, you do have four different ways. You don't get many of them. Like, I don't think you're looking at Savage World bennies or fate tokens from a, a fate game level of resource management here. You're not building things up. You're going to get like one to three fate points that generate one to three fortune points and like one or two resilient points that generate one or two resolve points. Now, two of these faint resilience once spent are gone, like gone as far as this box is concerned, gone forever. And I remember in the original Warhammer, earning a fate point was like at the end of the enemy win thing campaign, you get one. So similar to the original system, you're not going to get these back. Now, Fortune does. Fortune comes back every session. But that's rerolls. One to three rerolls a night to me isn't too much. 
And then resolve is kind of cool because it's like, oh, I want to ignore a negative story effect. But the only way you get that is by playing to your character and your motivation. So to me, it rewards playing to the story. You can get to control the story a bit more. And I think that fits well. So while they may have patched some things, they also embedded them into the system in a way that makes sense for the system. Yeah, I think so. So while that seems like a pretty solid overview of the mechanics in Warhammer without too much detail, yeah. to me, it sounds like they really went back to their roots, but mm. then added on these modern mechanics like spendable resources for randomness, rewarding playing to your motivations, and a system for combat escalation. So let's move on to the next thing in this box, a guide to Ubersreich. This is a thicker bound soft cover book clocking in a big old 64 pages. It includes the history of the city of Ubersreich going back to its founding up to modern times where there's a big old power vacuum as the rulers of the town were recently displaced by the emperor himself. And mm -hmm. the Altdorf troops patrol the streets alongside the town guard and watch. This is a district by district guide with a ton of detail. Mm -hmm. Now, while it doesn't mention every street and house, 70 different locations around town are fleshed out, each with at least two adventure seeds included, along with stat blocks. Yeah, this is the kind of book I expect to see when I see Warhammer on the cover. The odd part, though, is that this is in a starter set. To me, this feels like a standalone product. This is a 64-page splat book about Ubersreich. Reinforcing that feeling is that many of the stat blocks and other rule callouts require the full Warhammer Fantasy Core rulebook rules to be used properly. The characters have spells or talents that aren't mentioned anywhere in this book otherwise. Really, this is an Uber's Reich source book for the full game that happens to come in this box set as well, which I think is part encouragement for someone who owns the core rulebook to pick up this box, even if they're not new to the system or interested in starting adventures. Well, they do need to encourage additional purchases in both directions, I guess. Companies are here to sell us stuff. Now, if you're someone new to Warhammer, I think this book's going to be overwhelming. There's just so many facts and names and details and connections between various people in the city. Now, a staple of Warhammer over the years is presenting things as they are and leaving it up to the GM and players to determine how the players' actions will change those things. And that's what this book is. It's a ton of details of how things are right now in Ubersreich, which I've got to say this whole setting where the Empire marched his army in and outed the Jungfrids and now there's no one running the town and you've got like the king's troops basically patrolling the city along with the town watch like it's a fascinating setting and while longtime Warhammer fans are going to be used to this information presented this way I think it's going to scare away players who are more used to a scripted linear read the box here's what your players should do next approach to adventure writing so, if you like detailing your games, Warhammer, yeah. ha Warhammer has it for you, to be sure. It's a system that, while you can sandbox in, isn't really as suited to that as other games. So, I think in that case, I think we have different definitions of sandbox play. Because to me, Warhammer is the ultimate sandbox system. Because instead of a linear adventure, they just give you a bunch of things happening and interesting things going on, and this is happening, and this, and this, and this, and it's up to the players to choose if they actually interact with it. And there's settings there basically saying, if no one does go over there, this happens anyway. It, it's To me, it's the settings there, it's toys in the sandbox, is what Warhammer gives you, versus here's what happens, and no, well, if the players don't do this, oh well. Where Warhammer's like, well, I don't care what the players do, here's what's happening in Uber's rig. And that's fair, but I think due to the wealth of places and things happening that are given there, uh, if you try to invent your own places and events in addition, uh, okay. some GMs may be concerned that they're just going to end up stomping on something pre-written. You know, I want to have a fair. Oh, well, I forgot that on page 32, there is a, you know, night fair that happens. And how am I supposed to justify that with, you know, what I want to do? So there's just a little bit. Okay. Yeah, okay, I see your point. I don't I don't consider that sandbox play from the DM side, but I get it. I, I can see people, I, I personally don't feel it's at the Forgotten Realms level of I don't want to get it wrong. 
but I can see how that can be overwhelming. Like, honestly, there's no reason to create your own content when you got 70 different things with two adventure hooks each. There's Absolutely. 140 adventure hooks in that book. And that's like the supplemental book. That's not the main adventure. <laughs> that's not even the adventures. Right? I got to say, like, like even as a longtime Warhammer fan, this book took me quite some time to get through. Like, personally, I think it's great. It's here. And when I run this box set, I am when I use the main adventure, I fully plan to use that box or sorry that book to flesh things out right to describe different buildings and what people look like and throw in npcs i'll definitely be referencing the book to make the adventure feel more real as well as probably tossing in some of those extra seeds to make the the adventure more interesting and well different from everyone else's all right well that's it for the main things you get in this box the rest of the stuff is really here to supplement what we've already yeah. talked about so let's start with the maps. There are two thick card double-sided maps. One is meant for the GM and the other for the players. Now these show a map of Ubersreich and its districts on one side and the region surrounding the city on the other. So the GM map varies by having a legend and calling out all of the locations highlighted in the guide to Ubersreich. Uh, they're cool enough, though, you know, I would have liked like a fold out map like these are just paper sized card um, or even better cloth. I love cloth maps. I realize that would up the price. Uh, the problem with these is like there's no way to read them across the table. When I'm playing a, a role playing game that's not maps and miniatures, I just want to throw the Uber's Reek map out in the middle of the city and then maybe put an icon showing where the party is. You can't really do that on this tiny little map that's about this big. Like basically, you're going to have to pass these maps around. Uh, note there is also one more map, though it's not a separate sheet, but I already mentioned this is the bottom of the box. This shows a section of the Empire, and the Empire is the region of the old world where most Warhammer adventures are focused on. I'd actually be interested to see, I know that this set is available on Foundry Virtual Tabletop. Uh, I wonder how the maps are on that system. Interesting. Interesting uh, to know. Up next, we have the character sheets. There are six of these that have a character overview on the cover, that answers questions like, who is this? What are they like? Why play them? <laughs> the reason for this is that no one except for the GM is meant to open these before play starts. An interesting system. Now inside, along with the secret stuff, is a fully filled out character sheet with some rule explanations on one side and character background on the other. Now, these sheets use that same weird three-fold system as the read-first sheet, which I guess at least makes a little more sense here because there is hidden information. Uh, the character sheet's definitely going to look familiar to Warhammer fans, but different. And I love the background information on the sides, which has lots of modern story game elements like motivations, group ties and secrets. Uh, very, feels very Apocalypse World to me because it's literally pick one to three of these group ties and pick one to three of these secrets. And they even offer a carrot. The more secrets that you take, the more starting gold you get. Sorry, silver. You don't, you don't find gold. There is no gold in Warhammer. Rich people swear there's this, you know, shiny yellow stuff, but you'll never see it. Um, with While these sheets are designed to be played with, there's lots of room to like take notes, track your coins, track your wounds. I can't see doing that. I'm going to make sure everyone has a separate sheet of paper. Um, well, I would actually like to do is laminate them. I'm not sure I can do that because of the threefold thing. So I'll probably just give everyone a separate sheet. Now, as for the characters themselves, they are quite varied. And to me, not your typical set of Warhammer characters or your typical group of fantasy adventurers. I think they've definitely realized diversity is important here. You've got Elsie, the witch hunter, Morella, the halfling thief. Gunnar the Darth's Dwarf Slayer. Okay, well, you knew there was going to be a Dwarf Slayer. I don't think you can put out a Warhammer thing and not let someone play a Dwarf Slayer. Then there's Salundra the Sorcerer, Ferdinand the Wizard, and this one's fantastic. As a long-term Warhammer fan, I am really sick of every pre-gented warrior wizard being a bright wizard who casts fireballs. This is an amethyst college. This is the wizard cult of death, not your typical fire wizard, and a really cool choice. Even has the giant scythe. Uh, then you have Amrith, the High Elf Merchant. Overall, a great selection of characters that I think really shows the diversity of character choices in Warhammer. And in a way, I'm disappointed, but I also applaud them by not just throwing in the rat catcher with the three-legged dog, because everyone hears about that, or the gong farmer. Now, one thing to note, since it did come up earlier, 
there are no didn't come up earlier there are no rules for character creation here i probably should have thrown that into the rules above you have these six characters and that's it not surprising for a starter set although i have to say dwarf slayer is an odd term normally yes. we see giant slayer or ogre slayer or dragon slayer uh but to me dwarf slayer means slayer of dwarves uh so it's an interesting new naming convention they've gone with there and you are not the first person to complain about <laughs> um I, i'm not even complaining i just know i just noticed it it, it stood out it's as the a, as dwarf a slayer yeah. i think it, you need the pause well and it, and it makes sense but it's just a, a different yes. convention than they've used in the past well, next we come to the reference sheets. There are three of these, two of which are two-sided. Here's where you find the rules for playing Warhammer. There's a test sheet that goes through the three test types, the attributes, the skills reference sheets. That explains what all of the characteristics and skills cover. The injury reference sheet that describes wounds, healing, and critical hits. The combat reference sheet that gives all of the rules for combat in one place, including the rules for advantage, and the conditions reference sheet that covers various conditions, how you gain them, and how you get rid of them. Finally, there's an introduction to Ubersreich and the Empire, something each player should read over once to get an idea of the setting in which their adventures will take place. Okay, see, this is something that the Read Me First sheet should have pointed me to right from the start. I would have loved having these sitting there while I was reading the adventure book. All my complaints about no index and trying to reference that book are basically alleviated from these sheets. So take a lesson, future Warhammer GMs. Don't worry about looking up stuff in the reference. In the adventure book, use the reference sheets. Uh, all of these are well written, very clear, with the most shocking part really being that you can fit all of the Warhammer 4E mechanics on five pages. Well, next, we have a cardboard punch board containing advantage tokens. There are six of these for each character in six different colors and 13 white ones for the GM. So if you watch my unboxing video, you saw my disappointment with these. Uh, while doing this, the colors are so subtle and similar to each other. Even people with perfect vision are going to be hard pressed to tell them apart. If I remember correctly, there are two I just couldn't tell apart while recording that video. The thing is that I didn't know then that it doesn't really matter. Like, I guess it's nice that each character can have a set in their own preferred color, but that color means nothing. These are literally just a tracker to track if you have an advantage and how much you have. Yeah, I mean, you could use pennies and everyone could share a pot of pennies and it, yes. it would be just fine. Now, next we have the dice. A set of 2D10 dice from Q Workshop. So my other complaint during the unboxing was these dice, and I still stand by what I said there. While cool looking, they are way too busy and hard to read, especially across the game table. To me, these fail one of the main qualities dice need to be good. Dice need to be random and readable. These are not readable. These are actually my biggest disappointment with this box. I, I have to say, I am not a fan of this entire company's dice in general for this very readability reason. Now, if you like them, great. Yeah. But these are not a bonus item for me, and I recommend you bring your own dice to the game. Now, lastly, we have some handouts. There are seven of these, though six of them are gonna need to be cut out before they can be used. The first six are rumors your character has heard intended to spark conversation and role play. They are all tied to the main adventure. The last is a shopping sheet that explains how money works in Warhammer, as well as providing a short trapping list. So one interesting thing here is this is the only rule sheet that the adventure actually tells you to pull out during play and hand to the players. It literally at one point, I told you at the beginning, you're in a market. At one point, it goes hand the sheet to the player. Why didn't they do that for the other sheets? Like now that you're in combat, hand out the combat reference sheet to the players. I just thought that was a weird choice. Now, my biggest complaint about this, and unfortunate for some people, Warhammer 4th Edition stuck with the very annoying coinage system of one gold equals 20 silver and one silver equals 12 copper. Well, I guess thematic and nostalgic for long-term fans, I gotta admit I prefer base 10 coin systems, please. I don't want to spend my game time at the table trying to convert coinage types instead of role-playing. Now, as for the equipment list, it's pretty bare bones, but it's noted right on the sheet. There's way more stuff to buy in the core book, so it's serviceable for a starter set. 
So that's all the stuff you get with the Warhammer Fantasy role-playing starter set. Now, while you've shared your thoughts on the individual components and the mechanics, what are your thoughts on this box set as a whole? So physically, this is a beautiful, beautiful set. It comes in a very sturdy box. Like this is one of those boxes where I don't have to worry about it collapsing while being stored on my game shelf. Something that's often a problem with RPG starter sets. The books are all well bound, full color, easy to read, and filled with great evocative Warhammer artwork. Even better, it looks like this is all new artwork because it like features the characters that are on the character sheets. Like they did, I don't know if it's all new, but a a lot of the artwork definitely shows these situations that are happening in the adventure. And I can't wait to be like, oh, and you see this. And honestly, even the dice look great, though their functionality does leave something to be desired. Indeed, enough said about those, I think. Now, it's functionality that really gives me a bit of pause. The functionality of this entire set. As an experienced Warhammer player who's been around since the first edition and has played all the editions up to this point, this is a fantastic Warhammer product. This is perfect for diving back into the old world, learning the mechanical changes to fourth edition. And speaking of those mechanical changes, I got to say everyone I saw was a welcome change. This includes many new elements to address long-term problems with the the old D100 roll-under system. And I love seeing modern storytelling elements put into traditional games like this, seeing them evolve with the times. While I enjoy the modern storytelling elements, it's the randomness mitigation I still, without playing, uh, without having played, feel at most at odds with as a a new, you know, someone coming to this new system. I still think it's going to be worth it. I I think it's a way of giving players more agency than they've ever had in Warhammer before. But again, I haven't tried it at the table either. Now, where I'm not sure on this box is how well it would work for players who aren't long-term fans of Warhammer. While I think most players coming to this from another role-playing game, especially a fantasy role-playing game, and I'm sure you can think of a couple in particular, are going to be in a bit of a, a state of shock for the types of stories you're expected to tell with Warhammer. And the fact you aren't really playing heroes, I think the rules and mechanics should be easy enough to pick up through play, playing through that adventure. And the adventure book should work for teaching you a new system. Then again, everyone is the hero of their own adventure. So who's to say that a shoemaker forced to go out and fight chaos isn't a hero? Uh, They very well could be, and you can play heroes in Warhammer, but if you're playing Warhammer properly, that shoemaker's probably also doing a little bit of a side hustle there, (laughs) and also slipping some weird stone into the shoes of the people he doesn't like much around town. Now, it's with brand new role-playing game players that I think this box is going to be too much. I I worry it's going to be too much. I don't know how many brand new Warhammer players are going to jump into it from here, but I could see it especially being crossover from people who are fans of the other Warhammer games that are out there, the board games or the miniature games. The main adventure is well written, but it's not a very straightforward GM friendly read this to the players, then do this. I Like it's there, but it's not read the box. It's not as straightforward as some others. Now it does start off linear. There there is a series of unfortunate events that lead you to a point. But after that, it's kind of let the players do what they want. And that's going to be really hard for a new GM to handle. While there is some GM advice in the adventure book, it's really sparse. I can't imagine reading through that guide to Uber's rig as a brand new GM and not being completely, totally overwhelmed by the amount of information there. That book in particular seems to be written specifically for people planning on diving deeper or for groups who already have the core book. Seeing as I'm not a new player, though, or new to Warhammer, this is all speculation. Maybe this is just what a new group needs. But compared to the other starter sets I've read and reviewed, and I've done quite a few, this one seems a little too meaty and dense for a brand new RPG group. It does seem to be that while most starter sets are fantastic for new players, they can be really hit and miss as to the required skills of the GM, yeah. new or old. <laughs> Overall, this is a great box for Warhammer fans looking to get back into Warhammer and check out the new edition. This particular edition is going to appeal to fans of first and second edition. It's modernized many mechanics, but also brings back some of the dark humor and feel of first edition, which I think is a great balance. 
I also think this is a worthwhile box to pick up if you already own and are already playing Warhammer 4th Edition through the core box or any of the adventures that are out, because this did not release when the game did. This came out a number of years later. There is a ton of great information about Uber's Reich and a ton of adventure hooks, like, what do we say, 140 of them at least, as well as 10 short adventures, and that's without even trying to adapt the main story to your game. I also think this would be a good choice for groups who play other role-playing games, especially fantasy role-playing games looking to check out Warhammer. Now, again, where I'm on the fence is groups totally new to role-playing games, but who knows? I learned Warhammer First Edition by reading the, I don't even know, 600-page massive dome. <laughs> so maybe it really will be the perfect start to a lifelong love of role-playing. I, I still have my, my First Edition book, uh, right? Actually, I've got the, that was my third. My first edition is back there, I think. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> too many editions hanging around. Uh, so that's it for our look at the new Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Starter Set, the entry point to Warhammer 4th Edition. Now, before I go, I just want to invite you to also check out my written review of this RPG box set over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so the first is something old. We're going to start with something old and something new, and I don't have something blue to talk about, though. Um, so first off is the Duke, the classic two-player chess-like awesome, great two-player game that I love. Like, like this is just still awesome. I, it's as good as I remember it being. Um, I will say it's been long enough that we kind of forgot was in our bags. So we got to do the, I moved my Duke. Okay, I play pull a new unit. And I'm like, whoa, what the heck is that? I don't remember that one. Um, then there were a couple powers, like the Oracle. The Oracle came out and I'm like, what What the heck's the Oracle do? And I had to reroute the rules for commands. Command is the weird one where you flip it and you get to move another piece. And I'm really glad they included reference sheets. I have very solid reference sheets with lots of graphics that helped us figure it out pretty quickly. Yeah, it's it's such a great game. And realistically, it only vaguely rewards game knowledge. Like the fact that you know what's in your bag, it's still a random bag pull. Yeah. So, you know, I remember the last time I was playing with my son, he was like, I want I need an assassin. I need an assassin. I need an assassin. I need an assassin. Mm -hmm. Never came up. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, it's he got into a point where he got it kind of got himself stuck. And, and that was the one card that would have made all the difference and probably won the game. but. Couldn't Come get in. it. See, to me, what the knowledge that's rewarded is remembering what's on the other side of the tiles. Now, of course, you could play with the, every time your opponent puts out a new tile, you show it to them so they could see both sides. By the rules, you're supposed to like remember that stuff. That was the big one for me is not remembering that, you know, the bishop switches from moving diagonally steps into a straight line and things like that. And that's where I got destroyed, actually, on a, <laughs> a couple moves. Now, the one thing, though, that did confuse me completely is the shield ability. And since the night we played, I keep meaning to look it up because we were trying to figure that one out. And we're like, OK, if the shield is over a unit, can you attack it or does it have to go through it? And I don't remember having that much ambiguity before with that ability. So I think it's just me forgetting how shield works. And like I said, I keep forgetting. Maybe I'll remember at the end of the show tonight. You know, Google the Duke Shield ability or or Yarl. I know it's also in Yarl. You know what it is? I think Yarl explained it better. And I think that's why I didn't have the problem in the Duke because I own Yarl. Right. But anyway, despite somewhat ambiguous wording on Shield, I'd still strongly recommend the Duke. You, it's it's Catalyst Games Lab. The latest edition is called the Duke: The Lord's Legacy, which includes some of the expansions that were in the original. If you can, if you like two player abstract strategy chess like games that aren't white. As brainy as chess, because there is random factors you could lose due to luck. A little quicker playing than most chess games. Well, I don't know. People play speed chess, but whatever. <laughs> most average people playing chess, it's quicker than that. I strongly recommend the Duke Lord's Legacy. Yeah, and so uh, if it's the same as Jarl, it, it affects the pe places, people who are under the shield. Yeah, see, when you read the rules in the other one, it says if your attack passes through a square with the shield mm. is the rules in the Duke, and that's where it got confusing, was do you have to be on the other side of the shield? But anyway, well, I suppose so. I suppose it's it's covering for the uh, spearmen who can attack two away. So if the shield yes. is in the way, it also stops. Well, there's the lots of things that can attack two away with jumps and slides. Your duke can attack two away, for example. 
Iowa, great game next though, one. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, all all levels. I'm, my son's got uh, started with that one quite early on. Uh, now mm-hmm. he did. Like, he also likes chess, which may be part of it. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, great game. Next is the new to me game, game I'd never played before, and that is Shikoku. This is a unique racing game, though I kind of hate to call it a racing game because it's not about getting to the end first. Uh, the theme here is you're on the island of Shikoku in Japan, and this is an island that has all kinds of temples, and people take pilgrimages to it to prevent bad luck. I guess if you're Japanese, if you're a woman and you don't do this by age 33, you're going to have bad luck, and if you don't do it by age 44 as a man, you're going to have bad luck, whatever. That's a theme. Basically, the point is you are climbing up lots of steps, and each step you have to say a mantra and leave a donation. Now, what the gameplay is about and the journey you would take if you did this pilgrimage is moderation. And that's the theme here. You are climbing the steps with the other players, and it's a race, except you don't want to be first. That's being impertinent. And you, if you come in first, if you get to the gate first, you lose. You also don't want to go too slow, because that would be inconsiderate to the monks at the temple. If you come in last, you lose. And it's actually the players in second and second last that win this game. Unless you're playing with three, then it's whoever's in the middle. This is an intriguing resolution, but I can see it being very controversial. And you definitely don't want to be playing this in a tournament. No, I don't think I can throw this one into into one of our great Canadian board game blitzes. It's interesting, too, because like the one game we played, three people won because they were all on the second step. Mm. Which is weird. Like, it, it, it's a neat game. Uh, the system's card-based. It's card drafting. You get three, there's three, 33 cards, one through 33. Each card has a number of um, shoes on it, and the shoes show how many steps you go up. And you start with three random cards, and then cards go out on the table, one for each player, and then your players move up randomly those many steps at the very start of the game. Then you play a card, and then after everyone's played a card, everyone moves up, but then the, then you then have to pick a card from the ones played, so whoever actually had the lowest number gets a new card added from the deck. So only one new card gets added each deck. And what really surprised me that I didn't get reading the rules is that you basically cycle the same cards over and over. So it's actually fairly easy to remember someone grabbed the 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 one or, hey, someone's got the 33. Where the one and 33 are the two cards you're guaranteed to move. Plus, there's a whole thing I didn't get into already, which has to do with if you're in second and second to last, you don't move in this system. Like, there's a little more going on, but it's still fairly simple. Like, honestly, kids could play this, but if you choose to pay attention and are doing the card counting and you're watching what everyone's moved and you remember what people drafted, you're going to be rewarded for that. There's a higher chance you're going to win. And I got to say, this is a game I played it, and I'm like, my dad would have loved this game. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, It has not gotten a lot of love and it has not gotten a lot of attention. Um, And I think I I wouldn't be surprised if the win conditions haven't been part of that. Yeah, Um, there are people I can already see in the comments. Just a quick little scroll through. Uh, There aren't a lot of comments, but people are already commenting on the end conditions and the win conditions. But you like you don't buy the game if you don't like that. Why would you even pick it up and play it? Like, that's the whole premise of the game. No, but there are but there are people who, you know, oh, look, it's a it's a new Japanese themed game. I've got to get it for my. Yeah, I guess. Or or whatever. Uh, It only has two hundred eighty nine ratings at all on uh board game geek despite being out since 2018 yeah so, it's not well the pandemic right that's yeah but 2018, into some of that. 2018 years. yeah uh, two years before it's only a one uh, uh weight of 1.86 yeah so it's, it's not, not it's not a meaty game no. but there's just a lot of you know planning to not rush ahead yeah <laughs> it's weird too like it's it's very tactical more than strategic you don't have a long-term plan it's more where am i now what do i know it, player order is huge seeing what people have already done and deciding if you kind of want to slip in between them and stuff is a big part of this. Now, at this point, I only played once. Uh, we played it at Brenda, so it was with the extended family, and everyone actually really liked it quite a bit. Um, mainly, I'm just looking forward to playing more. Um, I'm looking forward to trying this with our Friday night group, see what Kat, Tori, and well, with yourself when you're done, see what you think about this one. Because if nothing else, though, I just dig that this does something new for that win condition. I don't know of any other games where second and second to last win the game. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just taking a look at the player counts on Board Game Geek. Now, the game is listed as three to eight. Yes. Uh, the board game community says four to eight. Like, don't even bother with three. 
Uh, but well, with three, just that person in the middle wins, right? Uh, but they're recommending five to seven. So I guess the, that's the yeah. sweet spot is that five to seven range. Eight is just a bit too much. Yeah, I would. I I watched uh, before I did the unboxing, just so I knew what I was going to get in the box. I watched the uh, Tom Vassell's Dice Tower review, and that's what he said. He said seven and eight. It's just too long to get back to your turn. And welcome uh, our Cypher Unlimited Raiders. Yes, welcome <laughs> again. Thank you. It's like every week. You guys are awesome. You folk, sorry. Didn't we, uh, we are just uh, just finishing up a little chat about Shikoku from uh, what did Grand you, Gamers did you Guild. From? Grand, Gamers, Grand Gamers, Guild. Guild. Gamers Guild. Yep, thank you, Mark Spector. Yeah, this is a race game where if you come in first, you lose. If you come in last, you lose. And it's actually the player in second and second last that win the game. Yeah. I, or play or play or, or players. Moderation is the key yes. in the path to the temple. Yes. Yeah, Deanna misunderstood the one rule and, and kind of ruined it. So one of the things, if you are teaching this game, point out that the first person to get to the temple causes the end of the round. Anyone else that gets to the temple as well loses. So she was timing it so that like Holly, Holly didn't play. Whoever, Gwen got there first. She got there second. It's actually once you get to the temple at the end of the round, you look at what steps everyone's on. So being at the temple is bad. You rushed. So she misunderstood that, but played it perfectly. So I feel bad she lost because she oh. literally did get to the temple second. But because that's not she actually got how it temple. worked. Because no, you don't keep playing. You don't keep playing until everyone gets to the temple. Right. So if someone hits the temple, the game stops, and you look at what steps they're on. Right. So that is the one that now I know, because we played once, that uh, we will have to point out. It's me. It's it, I definitely I'm not like in the oh, my God, it's amazing. It's Azul. It's Garinto. But it, like, it's just neat. It's cool. Um, I I can't see getting rid of this until public play opens up and everyone's sick of it because you don't get a lot of eight player games. No, no, that's absolutely fair. Uh, but yeah, that count. Um, Now, compared to Takedo. So I, that's sort of the other game where you've got, uh, a, you know, again, sometimes uh, Takedo can be rather cutthroat, but yep. it also has that. uh that that sort of mellow. If you if you've got the right player count there, it can be the mellow path. How does it compare to Sakaido? Or is to that me, not a fair comparison? No, I don't think they feel at all. So no? okay. th this is this is almost a party game. Okay, like it's quick, 15, 20 minutes. It's card drafting. Oh, it's really quick. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. This, this is this is not. There's no like I said, no real long term strategy. There's no encounters to be had. Like I said, you have to make a donation and say a mantra. You don't do that in the game. That's what actual people do doing the pilgrimage. In this, you play some cards, you move some meeples, you then draft new cards, then you play some cards, move some meeples, draft new cards, keep doing that until someone hits the top. Okay. Then you look at your position, relative position. All right. And honestly, it seems like the kind of game that like uh, it'd be very easy to make your own copy. Not that I'm telling you, you should pirate a copy of the game, like, but like just a, a a sheet of lined paper numbered one to thirty three, and then a bunch of cards number one to thirty three. You could you could basically pull this one off. Right. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So we did confirm today. Tori and Cat are heading over. They they are back in town. Well, technically they're not. They live out in Amherstburg, but they're back in the county. They're they're regional again um sean's coming down to join us as well so originally we did plan to do an extra life tabletop weekend but unfortunately that fell through and just didn't work out with the venue so i think we're just going to play some games uh hopefully lots of games um my for us the pile of obligation is near the top of the list because anytime i can let sean play the games we're going to review is always better because then he has something to say about it as well as me and isn't just, you know, adding little comments about how the game rates on Board Game Geek. Um, plus, I think our next episode is probably going to be a recap of that night because I think we're going to call it the last Sean Con. Because if all things go as planned, Sean will be here pretty regularly. So it's not going to be as much of a special event when we get <laughs> the game together. So I, I have a feeling our next episode is going to be the review of the last Sean Con. Uh, Sean from Hamilton Con. Yes. <laughs> Not Sean Con. No, well, yes, it's it's not Sean Con, but I think we might call this one Sean Con. It might be the Sean Con finale, as it stands. Um, Tori and Cat are actually free earlier this week, so maybe we can get in a few extra games. Oh, okay, that'll be cool. If Tori has to work on Saturday, though, it might get cut short. So, like, the big plan is to play. The problem is they're not all five player games. So that's that's what's going to make this part interesting. The Koku's up there. That that's that's a definite. Um, but like Point Salad and the other one are only four player chiseled. Is only four players, so I'm gonna have to look through what we have that's actually five player. 
to figure it out. But then we can play stuff on Saturday and Sunday that it'll be able to fit in those. But for Friday night, um, the other option is to play Ghost Betwixt, but I think I'm going to save that for when you're not down because that is four player technically. Right. And I don't know that it's going to take all night if we play that, right? Just to play one scenario. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, so that one's being held off. So I don't, I don't know exactly what we're going to play, but like I said, pile of obligations up there to get through some of that stuff. And who knows what else? We'll let you know next week what we played. Cause like I said, I think that's going to be the focus. Alrighty. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Jeff and Sheila Seuss. Thanks, Seusses. Kat and Tori, looking forward to gaming together. It feels like it's been forever. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle and Owen Thomas, thank you both. John P. Kelly, thanks, Sean. It's so weird to not be able to say of the game. Well, I guess you could still say he's from the podcast, but they're done. I can't believe that show ended. I know. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Digging the show, you can support us at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.